beautiful Sunday morning of uh, Jesus and Jeans worship at the cottage. We are, are very excited to have all of you here today. Boy, y'all came in a bunch, didn't you? Man, this is awesome. We got a lot. We still got folks outside that are, uh, so we got the speakers on outside, but uh, we're glad that you're joining us here today. It's going to be a, a great day here at the cottage. Uh, my name is Teddy Baker, uh, along with my wife Jan, Jim and Sandra Penner. We, we do this ministry every Sunday morning. Um, we want to welcome you, especially if you're joining us via the internet. Uh, we're, we're having a baptism and dedication today. and uh, So we may even have some folks uh, from, from Wales and across the pond that may be joining us this morning. So if, you're, if you are, we're, we're very honored to have you join us. We're always honored to have people show up and... Uh, Especially over the internet, we get a lot of great feedback from that, and so we're, we're just honored to have you. We're going to get right into uh, to our service today, because we got a lot going on, and we're going to try to get a lot finished uh, within an hour. This is one, uh, one of my favorite uh, praise and worship songs. It's a song about, we're just going to do one song this morning, and then we're going to get into uh, our baptisms and dedications. So let's sing a little bit.
Well, we ought to pray uh, this morning, and then we're going to get right into uh, our baptism and uh, and our dedication today is just uh, just a fun, fun time. We've got several prayer requests that I, I want us to to keep in mind, and the first one is uh, Dave and Susan White, some some friends of ours. Um, they have. Uh, moved to put Dave's mom in, uh, in, in hospice, and uh, they, they join us on a regular basis here uh, at Jesus and Jeans. They live down in Jacksonville, Florida, but uh, whenever they, they get the opportunity, they always come by and, and, and be with us. Um, also, uh, Catherine, uh, Sister Catherine, who actually is here this morning, uh, it was amazing because she usually comes in like on the second or third time. <laughs> But she came early, and I was going, oh, man. <clears throat> God must be doing something great here today, man. Got her up early and all kind of stuff. But her brother, Tim, uh, is uh, in, uh, in the hospital and uh, facing some very, very difficult uh, situations health-wise. And so we want to remember Tim in our prayers. And our brother Jerry, uh, we just found out, I uh, want to pray for traveling mercies for him. He's one of the folks from Paradise Valley, and he's, uh, he's doing a bucket list trip, and he's out on a motorcycle trip with a, a group of guys. Uh, and uh, so we want to pray for traveling mercies for him, that uh, he stays safe. You know, two wheels against like four or eight or 16, it's not good. <laughs> That's a difficult road to hoe, man, I want to do it. So we want to pray for traveling mercies uh, for them. Uh, we want to pray for uh, the Jones family here today. And uh, man, we're just excited for uh, the baptism and dedication of Karis and Lila today. It's just going to be a fun time. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for another day on this little knoll to be able to worship you today in spirit and in truth. We thank you for the privilege the honor that we get to live in this place and gather together as your children, as believers, to be able to worship you. God, we, we always acknowledge that we, we try as much as we can to stay out of the way, to stay out of your way, to say, come Holy Spirit, fill this place, and dwell each one of us. Give us just a holy hug today. And let us feel your presence in a very real and personal way. We love you, Lord. We thank you so much for loving us. We lift all the prayer requests that we've mentioned today, even those that we haven't mentioned. Uh, God, we, we praise you for all the healing and the things that are taking place in the lives of your children. We love you, Lord. Thank you so much for loving us. We ask your blessings today in the powerful name of your son, Jesus. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 As I said earlier, today we begin our service uh, with, with something that's unique to us, to, to Jesus and Jean's worship at the cottage. Today we're going to do a baby and a child dedication and a baptism. Uh, I have the honor of pre presenting before this congregation some of our great friends, Caroline and, and Christian Jones, along with Nicole Smith Jones, and, and their daughters, Karis, Elizabeth, and Lila Faith. It was, it was their desire to join us for worship, to baptize Karis and Lila, as well as dedicate them to the Lord. As a friend, as a minister, I, I could not be more excited about about their decision to do this. Once again, I've asked Pastor Bobby Privet to, to join me in this dedication and baptism because you're going to witness something that, again, is unique to us and to us alone. I don't know of any other worship service that does anything like this. And here's why. We come together to worship each week, being from many diverse backgrounds, denominations, spiritual beliefs and understandings. And the uniqueness is that many, many new relationships are being built here. And I believe that it's because of the diversities that we bring to the table and they prosper because, again, my opinion, I believe that we celebrate the things that we elevate. Does that make sense? 
So everything we lift up to the Lord, we celebrate those things. We don't major on the minors. You know, we, we, we try to really worship God in spirit and in truth. And I've told you many times, many, many times, that we don't have to be twins to be brothers and sisters. You know, that God made each of us different. And I hold that as a very high value. We're able to build a bridge through that diversity by combining things like my Southern Baptist background <laughs> along with Bobby's background as a Methodist minister. And today we're going to dedicate and baptize these two children. Now here's a, a scriptural reference for all of you to consider. It comes from Deuteronomy chapter 29, verses 10 and 12. And it says this. It says, Today you are standing in the presence of the Lord your God, all of you. Your leaders and officials, your men, women, and children, and the foreigners who live among you. You are here today to enter into this covenant that the Lord your God is making with you and to accept its obligations. That's what we're going to do here today, this morning. So with that, let's, let's pray again and ask, ask God's blessings. Father, we do pray your blessings on... on what's going to take place right now in the baptism and dedication of Karis and Lila. And we ask your blessing on their families and on their lives that they will grow up to know you in a very real and personal way. We pray that Jesus Christ will be lifted up in their lives and in their homes. We pray, God, for the empowering spirit of your Holy Spirit to to guide them and direct them and lead them toward a, a very strong and powerful faith that they can stand on from here to eternity. Again, we love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. We ask your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So I want to invite Christian and uh, Caroline, if you'll come with Karis, uh, along with her godparents. And... Um, and then, uh, Nicole, if you will come, and we're just going to have you stand right in here. We want to be able to put the camera on you so we, anybody watching can, can join us. And uh, Sarah and Ryan, if you will come with them, with uh, Nicole. Now, I've asked Bobby to lead us first in the baptism, and then I'll, I'll close uh, with my part. Okay, so before we, be, before we begin, for the godparents, I want to ask you some questions. And as I, I, I want to ask you collectively, so uh, as I ask you these questions, you'll, you'll answer. And I'll, like I said, this is not a trick question. I'll, I'll give you the answer. So uh, you'll have no, have no problem with it. But uh, just one thing that I want to, we just want to be clear as, as we move forward. So this is for the godparents. Do you believe and trust in God the Father who made heaven and earth? Do you believe and trust in His Son, Jesus Christ, who redeemed mankind? And do you believe and trust in His Holy Spirit who gives life to the people of God? Your answer to each of these must be, we believe and trust in Him. We do? All right. And likewise, do you reject Satan and all rebellion against God? Do you renounce the deceit and corruption of evil? If you do, your answer must be we reject and renounce them. We do. We do. All right. Psalm 127, three, uh, verses 3 through 5 says this. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. These children that you bring before the Lord are gifts from your heavenly Father. Their presence here today is therefore an occasion 
to celebrate and, and to reflect God's goodness. Christian, Caroline, Nicole, if you consider yourselves blessed to have the opportunity to celebrate and reflect on God's goodness, then your response must be, we do. We do. <laughs> Scripture commands you as parents to teach your child about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, I'm, it, where's Bobby? We, we got, we're going to go ahead and, and go first with the, the baptism, and then, and then I'm going to finish the rest of this now that we got the first part of the we do's behind it. <laughs> well, I'm ready. Uh, about 18 years in ministry, uh, I never had the opportunity to baptize two precious angels on the same day. Oh. I won't forget this. Aww. Thank you for this honor. Mm. Hey, Lila, you look very pretty today. Thank you. <laughs> As I understand it, uh, during the conversations about uh, baptizing Kairos, uh, Lila asked if she could be baptized too. Nobody would say no to that. <laughs> no. So if you come stand beside me, honey. Um, as you grow older, you're going to understand a lot more about what's going on here today. But today, very simple. What this means is Jesus loves you. Your parents love you. Your godparents love you. And all these are my BFFs. They're my best friends forever. <laughs> I promise you, they love you. Amen. Amen. What's your full name, Lyle? Lyle Lila Faith Jones. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm. Thank you, Dr. I've been waiting for this for a long time. <laughs> um, I'm not going to be in any hurry. <laughs> No. Oh boy. <laughs> right now she's mine. Thank you. Karis Elizabeth Jones. Karis Elizabeth Jones. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Normally what I would do now is just walk around with these precious and, and introduce them to you, but it's a little bit tight in here today. But <laughs> I want you to see the two newest members of God's family. Yes. yes. Oh, yes. Christ our Lord, do all that you can to support their parents and to support them that they might have the life that Jesus means for them to have. Amen. Thank you, Bobby. Now I want to finish out my part of the, the dedication portion. Scripture commands you as parents to teach your child about the Lord Jesus Christ. Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9 says this from the message translation. Love God, your God, with your whole heart. Love Him with all that's in you. Love Him with all you've got. Write these commandments that I've given you today on your hearts. Get them inside of you and then get them inside of your children. Talk about them wherever you are, sitting at home or walking in the street. Talk about them from the time that you get up in the morning to when you fall into bed at night. If you will take this seriously, then I believe that Karis and Lila will be adequately equipped for the challenges of this life and sufficiently prepared to meet the Lord when He returns. 
But your child's spiritual welfare will not be accomplished simply by telling them about Jesus. It is the words of your mouth combined with the obvious presence of the Holy Spirit in your own life that will effectively communicate the message of God's love and saving power to your child. The birth of your daughter Karis along with her sister Lila needs to inspire each of you as parents and inspire within you a greater resolve to let Christ shine through you by being even more intentional in the pursuit of your relationship with Christ and the supremacy of God in your home. Christian, Caroline, Nicole, do you commit to inspire Karis and Lila to love God and to know Jesus not only through what you teach them but also by how you live your lives through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit? If so, your response must be, we do. Deuteronomy again in chapter 11 it says see that I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse the blessing if you obey the commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you today the curse if you disobey the commands of the Lord your God and turn turn from the way that I command you today by following other gods which you have not known as the body of Christ we are all part of the family of God and as a family, I'm, I'm asking you to work alongside Christian and, and Caroline and Nicole when needed in the efforts to portray Christ to their children. Parenting is not an easy job. There's a few things they don't tell you when you sign on with this outfit. <laughs> and so my question is, are we merely spectators or will we rise to the challenge of being brothers and sisters in Christ and exhibit godly characteristics to hold one another accountable in order that the purity and integrity of our commitments are maintained. You have heard Christian and Caroline and Nicole state their commitment to a greater level of Christ-likeness for the sake of their children. Will you now acknowledge their commitment and indicate your willingness to help them keep their promise? If so, Jesus and Jeans, worship at the cottage, your response must be, we do. We do. Amen. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for this day and thank you for these families and these two beautiful children. Again, as we baptize and dedicate them to you today, Lord, again, I pray that your Holy Spirit will fill the lives of not only these children, but their parents and the homes in which they dwell in. Bless them as they go into this world, Lord. Be with them every step of the way. And we'll be quick to give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. God bless y'all. Thank you. We have those certificates. Are they on the truck? Put them in here somewhere. Certificate. I'll walk out. I'm not thought I carried them out.
brings all of us together in all these diverse backgrounds. I want to talk about today in the time that we have remaining about uh, a subject. We've been in a freedom series. We started off with the legacy of freedom on the 4th of July weekend, the Sunday before the 4th of July. Last week we talked about living the life of freedom in Galatians chapter 5 about what Paul taught us about freedom, that it was for freedom that Christ set us free and it, we, we explored that. Today I want to focus on freedom from your past. It's a very, very powerful subject. And we're going to be in the book of Colossians this morning in chapter 3. And we're just going to go through chapter 3 and we're going to take a look at how we can get find freedom from your past. Truth is that we all have a past, don't we? Some, like mine, are a little more colorful than others. <laughs> Even darker in places in my life. But we all have a, a past. Parts of it, parts of our past hold on to the things that we've done to ourselves and to others. Some of our past holds on to the things that have been done to us. But either way, your past can be stuck in this holding pattern that produces fear and guilt and shame and doubt. And finding freedom from your past is one of the most holistic experiences that you'll ever encounter as you go along this faith journey that we're all on. Have you ever felt so guilty that, that you long for forgiveness? Or maybe even perhaps even punishment. In a short story, it's called The Telltale Heart. Edgar Allan Poe wrote about a murderer who put his victim under the floorboards in his house. And when the police arrived to question him, he started to, to hear a heart beating. And the longer the police stayed, the louder the pulse became. And the mur this murderer was convinced it was his victim's heart trying to reveal his guilt. And finally, the, the sound became so loud that he confessed to the police what he had done. He thought the police could hear the heartbeat as well. But they hadn't heard a thing. <coughs> the heart he heard beating louder and louder was his own. Spurred on by a guilty conscience. And the only answer to a guilty conscience is forgiveness. But not everyone believes or even understands forgiveness. And so that's the question this morning. Do you? Do you believe in forgiveness? Do you understand what it means? Some people say, well, from now on I'll be very good. And I'll make up for all the wrongs that I've done. But that doesn't work, does it? Others think that, well, if I feel bad long enough and get depressed enough, then the guilt will go away. But that doesn't make sense either. I think it's like saying that, well, if I just keep beating my head against the wall, my headache will go away. But actually, it just gets worse. It causes more damage. I'm, I'm sure you, you've heard people make excuses like, well, I'd do better if I wasn't so sick or if I wasn't so poor, if I wasn't so rich, if I wasn't so abused. All these things. And we would all like to make excuses at one time or another. However, our excuses do not remove our guilt. Or it doesn't correct our wrong or the wrongs that have been done to us. Some people are hung up on forgiving themselves. They say, if I could only forgive myself, I'd feel better. But I learned a long time ago in my own recovery that if onlys will never change a thing, will they? And so this really is a good picture of how many people live in our society today. And so in Colossians 3, 1 through 11, we're going to discover this morning that if you want freedom from your past, then where you put your eyes is very important. Instead of looking down, 
Instead of being focused on the wrong things, Paul challenges us to look at three primary areas to find freedom. He says, first of all, look up. He says, look out. And then he says, look in. The French philosopher Henri Bergson says this, to exist is to change. To change is to mature. To mature is to go on creating one's self endlessly. And that really is the hope of the journey, is that we all mature each and every day more and more into Christ-likeness. And so as we look at Colossians 3, we'll, we'll learn that if we, get, if we get Jesus right, if we get Christ right, we get everything else right in our life. Jesus is supreme over his creation, his church. And, and now we're going to see in chapter 3 that he's supreme over the, the Christian life, especially when it comes to issues in the area of our past. There are practical implications that should be evident in each life that has been surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus. As such, we move from principle of the Scripture, we move from principle to practice. We move from the is to the ought. And you've heard me say that it's, it's kind of like going to the dentist. You know, I, I don't want to offend any dentists that are in here, but it's not one of my favorite places to go. <laughs> but you start out with the have to, and then you move to the ought to, and then you move to the want to, and then you end up with the love to. So the same way as with our faith journey. We have to make a change in our life. Things aren't working out. You know, you start asking yourself the Dr. Phil question. How's that working out for you? <laughs> and it's not. And so you realize, I have to make a change. And then you get to a place where you go, well, you know, I really ought to. I got kids. I got a reason to get up in the morning. I ought to make a change. And then as you grow in your spiritual maturity and you start studying God's Word and it becomes alive to you and the Holy Spirit starts changing you from the inside out, you get to a place where you want to. I want to read God's Word. I want to find out what's in it. I want to apply it to my life. And then finally you get to the place where you go, I'd love to. I love getting up every morning. I love beginning my day with the Lord, talking to Him, walking with Him, being with Him, and Him with me. Have to, ought to, want to, love to. Mm. You see, it does little good if we declare and defend the truth, but fail to demonstrate it in our own lives. And finding freedom from your past requires a lot of work on your part. It, every day as believers, we are called to demonstrate the presence of Christ in us. That's why I tell you all the time, you know, be a witness for Christ. And yes, use words if you have to. But people should be able to see Jesus in you. They should be able to feel the presence of the Lord around you for folks to notice that there's something different. You see, the pagan religion, religions of Paul's day, they taught little or nothing about morality. A worshiper could bow down and before an idol and put an offering on the altar, and then they could go right back to living the old life that they, they'd been living all along, the old life of sin. And what a person believed had no direct relationship with how he behaved. And Christianity is much different. In that we have the Holy Spirit continually guiding us into right living. Our desires become different. Our hearts are changed. And that affects the way that we think, the way we feel, and the way we act. Romans 8 from the message 11 through 14 says this. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, He'll do the same thing in you that He did in Jesus, bringing you alive to Himself. When God lives and breathes in you, and He does as surely as He did in Jesus, 
You are delivered from that dead life. With His Spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as Christ. So don't you see that we don't owe this old do-it-yourself life one red cent. I love that. <laughs> There's nothing in it for us. Nothing at all. The best thing to do is give it a decent burial and get on with your new life. God's Spirit beckons. There are things to do and places to go. <laughs> I love that. In all of his letters, Paul has been arguing that we're set free from the powers around us, from the effects of the world around us. And now he tells us that we've been set free for living a life that's above moral re reproach. That doesn't mean that we don't make mistakes. We do. Every day. But God's plan is first to make us new. And then He challenges us to live as new people. And in short, we don't, we don't have to live and be like we've always been. We can truly have freedom from the past. From the things that have burdened us and tripped us up. If we know where to look. That's why we're going to look at this morning three places to find freedom from your past. And the first one was to look up. Colossians 3, 1 through 4 says, instead of gazing at the ground, we got to look up. And so it says, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears then you also will appear with Him in glory. The opening phrase of Colossians 3.1 parallels with Colossians 2.20. It says, since you died with Christ. And if you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, that is what happened to your old self. You have died with Christ. And as I've taught you on several occasions, since we died with Christ, we don't have to follow the rules of a, a hollow and a, and a deceptive philosophy of life. Colossians 3.1 establishes the truth that since we've been raised with Christ, we have a, a new status and therefore a new way of living life. We now have a power source for living. Believers have died with Christ, been buried with Him, have been raised with Him. And as Ephesians 2.6 says, that we are already seated in the heavenly realms with Him. That is our position. But you have to appropriate these truths on a daily basis in order to experience that freedom from your past. If you don't believe that the enemy of your soul won't remind you every day of the things that you've done and the mistakes you've made and the guilt you fear, feel and the fear you face, all that kind of stuff. Again, the Bible tells us that he's like a, a roaring lion. He's seeking whom he can devour. And so Paul says, look, look up. Focus your mind on the things of heaven. Walk around with that. Paul writes, set your hearts on the things above. Now, I'm sure you've heard of old, an old phrase that said, you know, he's so heavenly minded that he's no earthly good. You ever heard that phrase? <clears throat> and while I guess that that's pop possible, I think there are a lot of people that just walk around so, you know, thinking about so much of, of the heavenlies that they, they don't see what God's doing around them. That's the experiencing God model is that we see where God's working and we, we choose to go join him there. But the reality is, is again, while I guess that's possible, it's more likely today that we're so worldly minded that we're no heavenly or earthly good. We're, we're not any good in either place because we're focused on, on us. It's all about me. What I want. I want what I want when I want it. And again, 
When you look at the word sin, what's the middle letter? I. I. And so if we truly set our hearts on things above, we'll experience power and freedom here on this earth. The word set means to seek something without desire to possess it. That, that we're, we're set on it. This word is in the, in the present tense and it implies that we continue to seek every day the things above. It's not just a one-time decision. Well, I accepted Jesus today. Good. So, so what's next? Every day you live the life of Christ in you. It's not just a one-time decision. It has to be a daily activity. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 6. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If we seek out Christ and allow Him to become our ultimate treasure, our hearts will follow. And so that the first imperative is to, to set our hearts on things above. The second thing that Paul says is set your minds on things above above, not on earthly things. And this literally translate to keep on thinking as a matter of habit on the things above and not on the things of the earth. You see, our feet must be planted on the earth, but our minds really should be in heaven. Thoughts can influence actions, so if we place our thoughts above and not on the earth, our behavior will reflect those things that matter to God. That's, when I, that's what I struggle with. Again, I've told you before, when I'm driving down the road and someone cuts me off, I don't think of the things above right then. I struggle with that. And, and, and so it, it's those things that happen to us every day that is, really becomes the challenge to us. What is it that yanks your chain? You know, what, what is it that just twists that knife in you a little bit? What is it? Because when those things happen, the practice of what Paul is talking about is that you need to focus your mind in such a way that you begin to look and ask God for help during those times. If I can learn to bite my lip and, and really seek God's presence in my life at that moment, I wouldn't struggle with that stuff. But sometimes it happens that quick. And, I, and, and if I'm not already focused on the Spirit of God, it's hard to get Him in there when that thing goes off. <laughs> You know, and, and so for, for by nature, by human nature, the sin nature that's in us causes us to respond that way. For many people that I've counseled over the years, their lives are like a sketch from the, you remember the comedian Rodney Dangerfield? You remember, you remember that guy? You know, I get no respect. You know. And Dangerfield built, built a career on that. He said, when I was born, I was so ugly, the doctor slapped my mother. <laughs> When I was a kid, my parents moved a lot, but I always found them. <laughs> my psychiatrist told me I was crazy, and I said, I wanted a second opinion. He said, okay, you're ugly too. <laughs> I was so ugly, my mother used to feed me with a slingshot. <laughs> and so many of us as believers spend way too much time focusing on the negative aspects of our lives. I told you, you know, you have 100 people show up and every 99 walk out and go, man, I was blessed this morning. And one guy or gal will walk out and go, but I didn't get anything out of it. You know, I, I just really don't like what you're doing here. <laughs> but am I going to focus on the 99? No. <laughs> what did I do to tick you off, lady? <laughs> it's just, it's human nature. And the Bible says that if we fix our gaze on things above, God will change our desires. If we change our mind, God will change our heart. And it requires putting our brain in gear, focusing on those things. I used to say, I need to Philippians 4.8 something. So I, you know, when something would happen, I'd say 4.8 it, 4.8 it. 
And it says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Paul's urging us to look up, to remember who we are now, to remember who we once were and who we will be when Christ returns. Where are you looking this morning? What does your mind focus on? Who gets the attention of your heart? Our outlook determines our outcome. Does that make sense? Our outlook determines our outcome. And keeping our minds and our hearts in the right place will determine where we end up. The second point is to look out. In verses 5 through 9, it says this, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as anger, rage, <laughs> malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. And do not lie to each other. And again, because we have died and we've been raised with Christ, we have spiritual power to slay those desires that want to control us. And while we can't totally eradicate this sin nature that's in us, we can treat it like it's morally impotent. That it's a, a morally impotent force in our life. Because the new life calls for more than just getting rid of a few vices and sort of beefing up our spiritual life by going to church once in a while. What gets renewed is the new self, this new part that we take on, not the earthly nature, not the old sin nature. Positionally, we have died in Christ, and now we need to live it out practically. In Romans 6, 1 and 2, it says that we are no longer to let sin rule over us. It says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? <laughs> By no means. We died to sin. And so how can we live in it any longer? Paul wants us to, to look out. So he, he lists some of the struggles that we all have in this verse 5. And he, he says we must slay these with passion. That any time we see these desires begin to awaken in our lives, we need to take those thoughts captive is what the Bible says. And cut them off at the place of entry. And you know where that place of entry is? Most of the time it's right here on the side of your head. It's called an ear hole. And whatever gets past that ear hole gets into your head. So what you listen to, what you focus on, whatever gets past there is going to end up here. And what ends up there can affect what happens here. Does that make sense? And so... The Bible says you don't just put them aside. He says we're not to just wound them or we're not just to ask them to leave, like go away. We're not to experiment or play around with them. We're not to rationalize with them or try to explain them away. The Bible says kill them. Get rid of them. Kill them. By killing them that we're, we're able to take those thoughts captive and bring them into the obedience of Christ. God loves you too much to allow you to mess up your life with life's struggles. He's not a killjoy. He's not trying to rob you of your joy. He made you and He knows what's best for you. You see, our physical desires are divinely given. But they become evil when they're motivated by the sin nature in us. And when they are executed for an evil end. You see, Jesus will give you grace, but He also tells you the truth about who you are, about the sin in your life. And He is the perfect embodiment of grace and truth. 
And just as he told the woman caught in adultery, he said, go now and leave your life of sin. Go and sin no more. And so too he calls us to look out so that we can follow him completely. Verse 7 reminds us that this kind of behavior belongs, belongs to our own life. And it should not be part of that present pattern of living. In verse 8 and 9, we're told to rid ourselves of social sins. You know, and by the way, we often dis dismiss these sins as, well, those are the little ones. You know, I have, a, I have a little bag of little sins. They're just, they're the little ones. And so sometimes they're easy to overlook in our life. Yeah, I'm not going to worry about those right now. But Paul doesn't. He says the image here is taking off old smelly clothes. Why don't you take off those old smelly clothes and don't put them back on again? The verb rid calls for immediate, decisive resolution. And before new garments can be put on, the old rags must be discarded like anger. This, the continuous attitude of hatred that remains bottled up inside of us. Rage is what comes bursting out, often uncontrollably. Malice is an attitude of ill will towards a person. It's often hid, hidden in hatred of the heart that takes revenge in secret. Or slander, filthy language, lying to one another, it disrupts unity by destroying trust. It tears down relationships and it leads to serious conflicts and these behaviors have no place in the Christian life. Then Paul says to look in. He says after looking up and looking out, if you're serious about freedom from your past, then you've got to look inside. And we do this by recognizing the truth about what happened at the moment that you accepted Christ. Verses 9 and 10 says this, Since you have taken off your old self, with its practices. And you put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. You see, as we look in, we realize that they're no longer, we're no longer what we once were. We've been changed. And because we're different, we have now resurrection power to act different. And the new self has been put on and yet even as we put it on, it's being renewed in the knowledge of the image of our Creator. We're created in the image of God. But because of our sin nature, that image has been tarnished a little bit. It's been defaced. And God's purpose and this spiritual journey is not only knowing His Son, coming to faith in Jesus Christ, is to restore His image in us, Christ-likeness. And that's where we take responsibility to renew our minds. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Look at this world. Look, look at all the divisiveness, all the anger, all the malice, all the depression, all the things that the world would have you believe about yourself. And Romans says, do not conform any longer to that pattern, to the pattern of this world around you, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's why I tell you all the time, I'm already educated beyond my level of obedience. It's not information I need, it's transformation I need. I got a lot of head knowledge. I got a lot going on up there. And if I ever let that get in the way of being renewed in the image of Christ, Man, it can take me places that I don't want to go. It can make me stand and look in the mirror and not like what I see for a long time. 
I want to close with the last part of these scriptures in Colossians 3, 15 and 16 are, are truly my life verses. And I adopted these as my verses a long time ago. And this is from the message. It says, let, that's an imperative statement. So anytime you see let, put your name in front of it. Teddy, you let the peace of Christ keep you in tune with each other and step with each other. None of this going off and doing your own thing. And cultivate thankfulness. Let the word of Christ, the message, have the run of the house. Give it plenty of room in your lives. That's our job. I want to close with this story. A little boy was visiting his grandparents. And he was given his first slingshot. And he practiced in the woods, but he could never hit his target. And as he came back to Grandma's backyard, he spied her pet duck. <laughs> and on an impulse, he, he took aim and he let it fly. And the stone hit and the duck fell. Fell dead. The boy panicked. Desperately, he, he, he hid the dead duck and he hit, hit the duck in the wood pile and only to look up and see his sister watching. Sally had seen it all, but she said nothing. And after lunch that day, Grandma said, Sally, let's wash the dishes. But Sally said, well, Johnny told me uh, he wanted to help in the kitchen today. <laughs> Didn't you, Johnny? <laughs> And she whispered to him, remember the duck. <laughs> so Johnny did the dishes. Later, Grand Grandpa asked if the children wanted to go fishing. Grandma said, well, I'm sorry, but I need Sally to help me make supper. <laughs> Sally smiled and said, oh, that's all taken care of. Johnny wants to do it. And again, she whispered, remember the duck. <laughs> Again, Johnny stayed while Sally went fishing. After several days of Johnny doing his, his chores and Sally's, finally he couldn't stand it anymore and he confessed to Grandma that he had killed the duck. Grandma said, I know Johnny. She reached down and she gave him a hug. She said, I was standing at the window and I saw the whole thing. Because I love you, I forgave you. And I wondered how long you would let Sally make a slave of you. <laughs> My question this morning is how long will you let the past control you? Are you ready for a change to take place? Stop looking now. Stop searching for something that will never, ever satisfy your flesh. Instead, seek Christ by looking up. Live for Christ by looking out. Surrender to His will by looking in. It makes all the difference in what your past looks like. You see, that's why the rearview mirror is always smaller than the front windshield. We spend time moving forward, not focusing on the past. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you that the power of your word has set us free. Free to live lives, not focus on the past, but to focus on tomorrow, today, even this moment. Father, help us to grow more and more into Christ-likeness. 
I thank you for this ministry and the ability that we have to reach out and around the world literally to touch lives. I pray for the people that keep showing up here searching for you. I thank you that we give you room to move and to touch our hearts and our lives. We pray, Lord, that you will help to strengthen our walk, to be all that we can be because you live in us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 God bless y'all. Thank you for coming.